Um, it's not designed to go the full 45 minutes, so we should be right on, we should be right on target here uh, for the remainder of the afternoon. So the ventilator's continuation process. Uh, disclosure, I have spoken for Medtronics on this topic. So ventilator dependency, you're stuck on a ventilator. Uh, one of the most important reasons, of course, is that you're too sick. Uh, ventilator dependency reflects an imbalance in the loads and capacities of the system. And that's depicted on this little cartoon here. We have a scale and capabilities on one side, demands on the other side. When capabilities, the neural drive and the muscle function are really good and the demands are really low, the pressure loads, the ventilation loads, any imposed loads because of dyssynchrony. Um, the balance is way off to the right and uh, normal reserve, we don't need a ventilator. And then of course the opposite extreme, when the demands are huge and the capabilities are terrible, way off to the left. And we clearly need a lot of ventilatory support. What we're talking about here are the patients who are getting better. They're starting to recover and we're, the balance is starting to swing from the left back over to the right. And our goal is to recognize when that swing is occurring and managing patients along the way in a comfortable and safe way. Now I think it's really important to also recall that ventilator dependency can be iatrogenic. And this is a really important point. This was brought out 20 years ago with the big weaning studies that were carried out here in Western Europe, the Esteban study and the uh, Brochard study. And these were two very interesting studies. They were trying to decide which mode of ventilation <laughs> facilitated getting patients off the ventilator, pressure support, CPAP, SIMV, TP's weaning, things of that nature. And they went around to ICUs. These studies were very similar in design. They went around to ICUs and they said, show us your patients who are ventilator dependent, who are having trouble getting off the ventilator. And so the doctors went down the hall and found patients who were ventilator dependent or they thought, said, yeah, here, here's a patient for your study. Both Esteban and Bouchard's study, however, wanted to confirm, wanted to confirm that these patients truly were ventilator dependent. So they did a spontaneous breathing trial on them. Guess what? <coughs> over two thirds of both patient populations passed a spontaneous breathing trial that very day, got extubated and never went in the study. <coughs> That's a piece of these, both these studies that you don't see as a major result, but I think it's probably the most important result. What am I trying to show you, I'm, or emphasize, I'm trying to emphasize that we need to be vigilant as to when patients are ready to come off the ventilator. <coughs> Here's a question for you, another way of looking at this issue. How many times, by the way, John, I want to remind you, does everybody have a pusher? Everybody has a clicker? Okay, good. Um, so you all know the rules here. What percentage of unplanned extubations are successful? So John, whenever you're ready. Um, it's another way of looking at this issue. Patients are often smarter than we are. Half the time, they are correct. Now, the flip side is also interesting. If you fail an unplanned extubation, your outcomes are terrible. But if you succeed, but you got a 50-50 chance or even better of succeeding. And the patients, what I'm trying to show you here is that sometimes the patients are more aware of the situation than we clinicians are. And this is this data collected by Scott Epstein a number of years ago to show the number of, or the percentage of times that patients were correct. As you can see, it runs about 50, 60%. We can also uh, have iatrogenic features uh, because of imposed loading. So we, 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 we make the patients work too hard. We give them unresponsive or insensitive triggers that uh, put unnecessary muscle demands on them. The flow dyssynchrony, the cycle dyssynchrony that John discussed yesterday, all of these can load the muscles, what we call imposed loads, 
that can make the, the challenge of getting off the ventilator even more difficult. Inefficient weaning rules. What does that mean? Uh, I've uh, mentioned several times that we like to do things at our institution by protocol. You've got to be careful how protocols are written. Because sometimes the protocol can be written in such a way that it may delay you. For instance, let's say your protocol says reduce pressure support by two centimeters of water every eight hours. And you're on 16 centimeters of pressure support. Well, you can do the math. That's going to take several days to get the pressure support down to around five, where you would be more comfortable perhaps extubating. Be very careful how you write your protocol. Make sure there are not inherent blocks, blocks to getting you uh, where you need to go. And I'm not, don't have time to go through this. I think you all know this. Unnecessary sedation clearly, clearly can delay the weaning process. So what I want to discuss, uh, these data are kind of old. Um, the ATS and ERS recently updated the guidelines, uh, and these were just published a couple weeks or a couple months ago. And I, I, I had to sort of smile at these updated guidelines because in essence they say almost exactly the same thing that was published 15 years ago. In any case, uh, there were some big projects back in the late 90s, early 2000s, one of which was the uh, McMaster Report that went through 5,000 papers addressing the weaning process, found 150 systematic uh, or quality trials that they reviewed, and published a huge report in November of 1999. This was followed almost immediately by a task force put together by the ACCP, the SECM, and the AARC to kind of take these uh, uh, analyses and put them into practical, usable guidelines. And as I say, 12 guidelines were developed. These were published uh, in December of 2001, and like I said, they really have kind of stood the test of time. It's quite remarkable how uh, the suggestions or the, the, the recommendations then are very similar to the recommendations that came out in the recent revisions. So, trying to predict who can come off the ventilator. This is from the McMaster report. They found eight parameters. In fact, in reviewing the literature, they found 86 parameters that had been studied, but only eight, only eight looked like they were really positive. Five of them are done on the ventilator, and three of them are done off the ventilator. The five that are on the ventilator is the minute ventilation, the negative inspiratory force, they have a PI max reported, which is best I can tell is the same as the uh, negative inspiratory force. The P.1, P.1 is effort generated, how much pressure you can generate against a closed shutter after 100 milliseconds of inspiration or inspiratory effort. It's thought to be a, a measure of respiratory drive and respiratory muscle strength. And this is divided by the maximum inspiratory pressure required to ventilate this patient. And the crop index, which is an interesting index that includes mechanics, oxygenation, and uh, <coughs> oxygenation, and I think it's muscle. Uh, I think it's spontaneous frequency, if I remember correctly. Uh, these are all interesting parameters that are very good at predicting coming off a ventilator. There are three others that you measure during a period of brief period of spontaneous breathing, several minutes worth the respiratory rate, the tidal volume, and the respiratory rate divided by the tidal volume ratio, the so-called rapid shallow breathing index, or F to VT ratio. So these are interesting parameters, and they all have very high, what we call likelihood ratios, that is, they predict success. The problem is they're not good enough to be used in isolation. The likelihood ratios are not good enough. None of these parameters should be used on an individual patient to drive the decision to take the tube out or discontinue the ventilator. And what the task force concluded was in fact what you needed as an integrated assessment during a daily spontaneous breathing trial. I've got a graph up here. Is this the one that works? Oh, it's a new one. Got to be, do you need this one? 
I, I like that green one. Oh, okay, so I give you. Don't we have the green one again? Thank yeah. you. In any case, this is coming off the ventilator over time. These are actually the results of those big weaning trials I described a few moments ago, looking at SIMV, looking at TP trials, looking at pressure support reductions, looking at combinations of pressure support and SIMV. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And what I want you to notice over here, this curve right here on the far left, yeah. you know what that is? That's not weaning anybody. It is simply doing a daily spontaneous breathing trial and leaving the patient alone in between. Let me repeat that. The fastest weaning protocol is one that doesn't wean. The fastest weaning protocol is the one that incorporates regular, regular spontaneous breathing trials on a regular basis. So the guidelines state that every day patients ought to be looked at for the potential to undergo a spontaneous breathing trial. Are they stable or getting better? If a patient got worse, this is not the day to talk about a spontaneous breathing trial. Is their gas exchange legitimate? Okay, these are just some numbers I threw up there that we use, but you can make up your own. Are they hemodynamically stable? Usually you're not interested in trying to get somebody off a ventilator if they're on significant pressors. And of course, can they breathe? Can they breathe? If they pass those four requirements, a spontaneous breathing trial is performed. And there are several options of doing a spontaneous breathing trial. You can drop the patient to five centimeters of pressure support. So that's kind of easy. If you've got somebody on, say, 12 of pressure support, it's simply turning the knob to five, you have now initiated a spontaneous breathing trial. You can put them on CPAP. You can put them on an automatic tube compensation mechanism. This is a little clever way of providing enough pressure to overcome the resistance of the endotracheal tube. You can go to just a straight T-bees, T-bar. We touched on this yesterday, <coughs> patients with heart failure and who are, who are potentially fluid overloaded with bad ventricles. Um, you take the positive pressure off of them, you may precipitate pulmonary edema. And in those patients, you might want to go to a T-bar, just to make sure. Interestingly, and I don't know why they did this, but the newer guideline committee recommended five centimeters of pressure support as the best way to do it. I'm not sure I totally agree with that recommendation. I think all of these are, use, excuse me, are useful. And then the assessment, as I said, is not a single number. It's not a single number. You want to look at the ventilatory pattern, especially changes. You want to look at the gas exchange. Are there any changes? You want to look at hemodynamics. Are there any changes? And then that all-important thing that is so difficult to define, how's the patient look? Are they comfortable? These, TP, these SPTs probably should last at least 30 minutes, but no more than two hours. If you're at the two hour mark and you can't decide if this patient looks good, that's a failed spontaneous breathing trial. Put them back, try again tomorrow. There's another question for you. Once a patient has passed a spontaneous breathing trial, is it safe to extubate them? Yes? No. On the clock? Good. No, it's not. Taking the tube out is different than stopping the ventilator. And that's really unfortunate because you read the literature on ventilator discontinuation procedures, often they're interchanged. They're used together. Some, some studies describe weaning success as getting them off the ventilator. Others describe weaning success as getting them the tube out. So you need to do a separate set of assessments here. And this is where we get into airway protection issues. Cough is essential. Cough is essential. 
Uh, there have been a couple of recent papers suggesting we should actually measure cough velocity. Well, doing a cough on with an endotracheal tube in place is rather challenging. So as a surrogate, what you look at is what the patient tries to generate, and you look at the expiratory flow graphic. And you ask the patient to cough, and if the expiratory flow graphic, the peak expiratory flow is greater than a liter per second, some would say two liters per second, that's considered an adequate cough. The white card test, I've, I've never used it, but the visual is quite, I think, informative. White card test is a piece of white paper. You take the tube away, you put it in front of the endotracheal tube, and you say, Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones, cough. And if the big goober, big piece of gunk, hits the card, <laughs> that's a positive. <laughs> One of the easiest ways to assess cough actually is to look at suctioning frequency. And the literature is thin, but there are some data that suggests that if you have to suction a patient more than every two hours, it may not be wise to take the endotracheal tube out. Less important, gag reflexes, cuff leaks. Cuff leaks are very controversial. But there's a lot of false positives and false negative cuff leaks. So to use it as a routine is not recommended. In patients in whom you are really concerned about an upper airway issue, uh, it probably can be helpful. Alertness, this confuses a lot of people. You do not have to be up reading the newspaper, filling out the crossword puzzles, to have an endotracheal tube taken out. As a matter of fact, a Glasgow coma score of eight or nine and above is usually compatible, provided the cough is present, is compatible with successful extubations. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. Despite your best efforts, some patients will have to be reintubated. Some get reintubated because they need the airway back. Some get reintubated because their respiratory muscles are just not quite ready to handle minute ventilation requirements. This should be in the 10 to 15 percent range. Should be in the 10 to 15 percent range. If it's lower than that, it suggests that you are really too conservative. If it's more than that, you need to calm down. Before you pull that too, go have a cup of coffee and think about it. A very interesting publication just came out. Sue Burns, uh, who's, uh, who's very involved in, in weaning protocols, did a really kind of cool study uh, whereby she looked at, I'm not even sure it's in the published literature. I'm, I'm waiting for it to come out because I want to get the slide. But she looked at uh, data in her institution over the course of two years, I think it was. And depending upon attending, the reintubation rates on some months were higher than they were on other months. And she shows very nicely that if you are below a reintubation rate of 5% or above a reintubation rate of 15%, your outcomes are worse. Your outcomes are worse. Anyway, it's a nice score to record in your ICU. So again, this is again Scott Epstein's uh, data. Um, as you can see, on average, and they reported in a number of reports, Somewhere in the 10 to 15 percent extubation failure rate should be expected. If you do this, if you follow this routine, spontaneous breathing trials in those who are ready for a spontaneous breathing trial, it was shown. God, this is almost yeah, this is 20 years ago now. This is Wesley and Lisa and other studies just like this that came out later. If you follow this procedure. You can reduce ventilator days, you can reduce uh, weaning days, you can, get, you can reduce costs. And there have been other studies since this one, but I'm one of the kind of people, I know it's fashionable to show the latest study. I think it's kind of fun to go back and show who really, who really described this phenomenon first. So for patients who failed the spontaneous breathing trial, what do you do now? Well, you search for reversible causes, that sort of uh, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Improve the loads, 
improve the capabilities. How do you manage the ventilator in between spontaneous breathing trials that have failed? And here's a question for you. John, don't turn on quite yet. A patient on pressure support of 16 has failed a first SPT. Subsequent patient management should be SIMV of eight, pressure support of 16. Wean the SIMV and pressure support is tolerated. Repeat the spontaneous breathing trial when you have an SIMV of zero and the pressure support is down to five. B, pressure support of 16. Wean the pressure support is tolerated. Repeat the SPT when the pressure support is down to five. C, SIMV of eight, pressure support of five, Wean the SIMV is tolerated and repeat the spontaneous breathing trial when SIMV is zero. D, pressure support of 16, don't do anything, just come back tomorrow and repeat the spontaneous breathing trial. So John, let's go on the clock. <laughs> I did not expect that one. Sorry? I'm trying to who, yeah, who guessed D? Okay, well, I do agree that D is the correct answer. I said this before, I'll say it again. There are no data, no data that says adjusting the ventilator in between spontaneous breathing trials does anything other than waste your time. So, for patients who failed the spontaneous breathing trial, provide stable and comfortable assisted ventilation. Very little effect, really no data, supports gradual support reduction and likely waste time. So how do we set the ventilator? We try to make the work of breathing in the uh, normal range. Uh, I'm intrigued that the PAV approach might uh, facilitate that, although, again, there are no outcome data that says that that really happens, but it's an intriguing idea and makes certainly logical sense. So you want sensitive and responsive triggering. You'd like to have the same support with every breath. Numerous studies have shown that SIMV, because you're alternating different breath types, confuses the patient's respiratory drive and makes them more uncomfortable. And again, maintain this level without change until the next spontaneous breathing trial. Keep them comfortable, come back tomorrow. So again, you want maximum sensitivity, balance intrinsic PEEP is needed, pressure targeting modes tend to be more comfortable. And I may have to change these numbers now after listening to Paolo uh, jump all over me for significant pressure support. <coughs> and again, making sure they're comfortable. Newer approaches, I touched on proportional assist. NAVA might also be a useful way of uh, setting up a comfortable form of ventilation. Both of these modes have theoretical appeal, uh, have been shown, and they work. These modes work. Uh, whether they really impact outcome is yet to be shown. So again, keep them comfortable, search for reversible causes, come back tomorrow, and this can all be done by protocol. In fact, most patients on ventilators come off after the first SBT. In other words, when the clinician says they're ready for an SBT, over half the time they're absolutely right, they're gonna pass. And another significant number will do it after two or three spontaneous breathing trials. Only a minority really are in the prolonged weaning category, which is interesting. It's one of those phenomenon where these patients uh, they may be few in number, but they consume a tremendous <coughs> amount of our time, don't they? But it is interesting that only 6% require more than three spontaneous breathing trials. Uh, this is uh, data from five years ago now, um, and as you can see, uh, in this situation of recovering respiratory failure, this is not ARDS, Florida ARDS now, or COPD with uh, uh, pHs in the 7-1 range. Um, Pressure support is the most popular mode. What about non-invasive ventilation? Paula touched on this yesterday, I'm not gonna belabor it. Um, two scenarios, uh, 
The patient has a borderline spontaneous breathing trial. They're kind of on the fence. Uh, extubating them and putting them on non-invasive ventilation has been shown to help. If it's not COPD, the literature is far less supportive. The other scenario is you think it's going to work. You think it's going to work, but you are wrong. Can non-invasive ventilation rescue you? Again, perhaps in the COPD population. But the non-COPD population <laughs> failed extubation. You probably should go right back and just re-intubate them. The question always comes up, uh, can this process be automated? And by automation, I'm talking about strategies that reduce the pressure support for you until it gets down to a fairly low level, at which point it either automatically starts an SPT or alerts you that you want to do one. Um, before I give you my opinion on this, I want to reemphasize that this assumes, this assumes that gradual reduction is helpful. And I've tried to make a case that I'm not convinced it is. But if you believe gradual support is useful, um, there are algorithms out there. Volume support is uh, pressure regulated volume control using the pressure support uh, strategy. Um, smart care. Smart care also is a pressure targeted mode. But it uses more than just tidal volume. It also uses minute ventilation and tidal CO2. Adaptive support is a sophisticated feedback mode that uh, could be uh, set up to uh, reduce support and alert you to a spontaneous breathing trial. So all of these are available. All of them will drop support and alert you to a spontaneous breathing trial. You can do the spontaneous breathing trial for you. So volume support, ASV, uh, it's just a feedback mode as we talked about yesterday. Smart care, uh, there's a lot of excitement about smart care uh, a couple, of, what, 11 years ago now, where smart care uh, looked like they came off the ventilator quicker. The problem with smart, this particular trial, is that uh, the control group was really suboptimal. Spontaneous breathing trials uh, were done less than 50% of the time. So you always have to be careful with a trial. If the intervention looks really good, is it because the intervention really is good, or is it because the control group is not so good? And in this uh, particular study, I'm afraid it was probably the latter. The study was sort of repeated, and now there was not much difference. Now there was not much difference. You can look at this in two ways. Number one, smart care is as good as a clinician. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's okay. Or clinicians are doing a fine job right now and don't need assistance. It's all how you want to look at it. So is there a role for automatic pressure support reduction? I've already emphasized more than once that there's no evidence that this facilitates muscle recovery. But there are two scenarios where I think these, these, these feedback modes may be of some use. Number one is the rapidly recovering patient. We don't have time to do spontaneous breathing trials every hour, do we? So conceivably, patients who are waking up from a drug overdose, patients who are waking up from anesthesia, this might be an area where uh, as they wake up, start breathing more on their own, these devices will alert you that Mr. Smith is recovered and is ready for extubation consideration. So that's one scenario I can see how in perhaps a cardiothoracic ICU with uh, trying to get people up and awake off the ventilator as quickly as possible, perhaps uh, this approach may be of some use there. Uh, the other population is sort of the opposite extreme. You have done multiple spontaneous breathing trials, the patient keeps failing, and you don't want to do any more spontaneous breathing trials. And I don't blame you. So you put the patient on this mode, and what, this, what these modes might, might do, and I emphasize the word might, is as, as the patient over weeks, not hours, not days, over weeks, gets better, 
you may see the smart care or the ASV or whatever your feedback mode is actually lowering the necessary pressure. And people who have used this, uh, these are observational studies, would recommend that when the pressure level has dropped 50%, 50% using these automated systems, it's time to try spontaneous breathing trials again. So it's not really treating the patient as much as it is monitoring the patient. But that's okay. That's okay. Who is it, Marcello? He loves monitors. I love monitors. Uh, I get that. Dr. Amato would like to make a comment. Please. Yeah. Turn the mic on there. It's uh, it's not it's not clear that uh, gradual weaning of uh, pressures improves. Right. But uh, there are some papers showing that too much assistance is bad. Right on, spot on. Um, we want the patients. I, I, actually, John Marini wrote a wonderful paper. God, it's probably twenty five years ago now. Um, and, uh, and, and he, he addressed that very, uh, uh, that, that very kind of, how much work should a patient do? How much work should a patient do? I actually have some slides. Um, I'll describe the, uh, the, the, the study. It was a rabbit study, okay? And they took the rabbits and they fatigued the muscles by electrical stimulation. These are normal rabbits, the lungs are fine. Okay, so now you've got Respiratory muscles that are totally